this has really not been a very pleasant day. Man, I sure do love waiting eight months for a 10 minute video. So that video where I talk about that game about a raging schizophrenic is, uh, it's taking a while to say the least, but trust me, it might be worth it. In the meantime, however, I think it's a good time to talk about one of my favorite Christmas movies. It is the holidays, after all. And that movie being the 1983 classic, A Christmas Story. A movie where this little boy here wants to become a terrorist. However, the most memorable part of this movie to me wasn't even this little gremlin of a child. No, instead it was this gremlin of a child, Scott Farkas. Why do I remember him so much? Well, look at him, he's got a funny hat. Scott Farkas was played by a Mr. Zack Ward. After Christmas Story, Zack Ward wasn't in a whole lot of notable movies. He was in Freddy vs. Jason, which, by the way, is an underrated movie, as Bobby Davis. He was Sergeant Donnelly in the first Transformers movie, and he was that guy who I don't remember in Resident Evil Apocalypse, a movie I also completely forgot existed. However, beyond all this trash, he was in one very prominent movie, one movie to rival them all, a movie where the opening five minutes has a 9-11 joke, Uwe Boll's Postal Movie. So yeah, that's what I'm talking about today, the film adaptation of the Postal Games. For those of you who don't know what the Postal Games are, they're mostly known for being juvenile and wacky open world games where you can chop off people's heads with a rusty shovel, kill Gary Coleman, and piss on a donut, leave it on the ground and have a cop eat it, and then they throw up. Innovative game design, EA should be taking some notes. There's also an isometric top-down one that's really dark and edgy, a really bad one, and the one that takes me over a year to talk about. And there's Postal 4, which is just Postal 4. It sure is a video game. The Postal Movie was directed by Uwe Boll, an infamous film director known for making some of the best trash cinema has ever seen, and with most of that trash being based on video games. And most notably, apart from Postal, is Alone in the Dark, widely considered to be one of the worst films ever made. And for the sake of backing that up, I did watch the movie. Did you have a nightmare? My mommy says that there's nothing to be afraid of in the dark. Your mother's wrong, kid. Being afraid of the dark is what keeps most of us alive. So maybe you're thinking I'm an asshole scaring that kid for no reason. But I'm just trying to protect him. It is very bad indeed. So with all that garbage out of the way, I think it's time to give my final and factual thoughts on the Postal movie. And what do I think of it? Well, as a movie based on Postal, it actually does a very good job and is seriously, no joke, the best video game to movie adaptation I think I've ever seen. But for people who just so happen to stumble upon this movie on fucking Tubi, they're probably gonna hate this for a multitude of reasons. So for us to find these reasons, let us grab the popcorn and get ready to compare, overanalyze, and enjoy ourselves in early 2000s video game movie adaptation of Postal. Oh yeah, by the way, I actually own this movie on Steam, which you can't do anymore since Steam removed the ability to buy movies now. Wow, if I had a nickel for every time a piece of postal media was removed off Steam, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it's happened twice. The movie begins with, and I shit you not, a 9-11 joke. These two goobers here, who are named Asif and Nabi, are confused about the number of virgins they'll get after they do this random terrorist act that involves a plane. What could it be? Well, hey, I'm not crazy, but what? It was 10. I call Osama Bin Laden, who tells them that he can't get them more than 20. Now, these goobers aren't Reddit or Discord mods, who, in all honesty, would do all this for one girl who is very, very far from being a virgin. So they say, fuck it, and plan to fly the plane instead to the Bahamas. But right as they plan to change courses, the indomitable and unwavering American spirit busts through the door to take these terrorist scum down. But that won't be the only thing that's going down in this scene. And boom, title card. Uh, to be completely honest, when I first watched this movie, this scene right here confirmed to me that this movie is gonna be better than I thought. Uh, this showed me that this movie was gonna do some blatantly unnecessary controversial shit, which is exactly what Postal likes to do. Speaking of shit Postal likes to do, it loves to take place in ironically named towns, like the town of paradise. Ah, it seems the movie is making the jokes for me now. The trailer park isn't actually something from the games, kinda. The dude does live in a trailer home in the games, but it's only in-game appearance, and that being in Postal 2, it's just kinda camped out in someone else's backyard and not in a dedicated trailer park. Boy, I love overanalyzing this movie. Pictures then flash by, showcasing the timeline of the dude's loving relationship with his wife, the bitch, who at one point was the goth girl that every unironic Wojak user dreams of. Too bad she looks like this now. They would still probably go after her. The dude is preparing himself for his job hunt. Holy shit! This is unironically the best video game movie adaptation of all time! It has the milk from Postal 2! And even as the dude leaves his trailer home, which, by the way, looks very close to the one seen in Postal 2, th the bitch tells him to pick up the welfare check! Mr. Mr. Welfare check. 
So far, this list of errors the dude has to do is actually fairly similar to the game. He even has his dog champ chilling in the driveway and shitting all over the yard. Feces in the yard. Now, I don't want to make fun of any group of people in particular, but as someone who does live in the southern part of the United Freedom Country, this is very close to the type of people I see roaming around the Krogers. Actually, uh, to be fair, Krogers too nice for this guy, uh, the Piggly Wiggly. Now, I don't care what you two do in your own bedroom, because if I hear you do love making after 10 a.m., I get to file a grievance against the sorry ass, which is exactly what I'm gonna do. Oh, for your information, Hillbilly, I wasn't even here yesterday afternoon. <laughs> the dude is a cuck. <laughs> that turned into a from a fake laugh to a real laugh, God. Another actual reference to Postal 2. The Lucky Ganache is the location where you buy the milk in said game, and is portrayed here as a corner store, which is also what it is in Postal 2. I know I kept joking around about this being the best video game to movie adaptation yet, but what really adds to this is that JK fucking Simmons is in this movie, and he's here to tell us some truth. The world's leading producer of located in the basement of the Pentagon. The big three television networks are all owned and operated by a right-wing church in Atlanta. One in every 10 people in America is on the payroll of the CIA. Well, fuck you! The back of the Lucky Ganache is also just like the game with it being a terrorist hideout. However, in the movie, it actually does a better job of showing that than in Postal 2, I think. My brother. This is also where we're introduced to Muhammad, a central character that I'll discuss later on in the film. Cutting back to the dude in his everlasting job search, he now shows up at a company called Glutco, a place that's not in the games, but does feel like something that would be there. Now, personally, I've never done any job interviews, being the niche internet micro-celebrity I am and everything, but I have filled out job applications, and this is what it feels like. What is your greatest strength? Um, I'm a really good team player. Wrong. What is your biggest weakness? Um, I'd say I work too hard. Wrong. How would you move a mountain using only a spoon? A spoon? If you were in a box, how would you think outside it? Uh, it's, well, if you're in- Wrong. And I'm sure every other wage slave can agree. I, I have called you today because you, you remember that scene in the Postal movie where the dude walks into uh, into Glutco and he, and he basically asks for a job and there's that the whole interview thing. Since since you're a professional wage slave, that, that scene is entirely accurate, correct? Yeah, yes, yes. Do you know how many times in the day I want to fill the entire air frying like little utensil filled with ice and just leave the fryer on and just walk out? Uh, I'd go as far as to say that Uva Bowl is the only genius in the fucking business with the way that he masterfully depicts this this whole industry of of you know capital america with the whole you know all the cock sucking ducks i have the ice in my bag chamber <laughs> the ice in my hand jamie uh, you know having somebody tell you you're wrong when in your heart you know you're right but in the end pulling through like with the indomitable human spirit it's it's just poetic shit really these motherfuckers ten dollars an hour telling me that the fryer isn't clean enough i have been here for 10 hours i think in my opinion i'd have to say uva bowl is probably the the only genius not only in the business but of our era um and i really I appreciate his work and what it does to represent, uh, you know, the, the, the lower class of, of capital America. Well, yeah, I, uh, I think that scene in that movie really uh, captures why everybody's going postal, in my opinion. Last question. What is the difference between a duck? you people a, a, a duck I don't yeah I came here for a job a job as far as I know that job has nothing to do with a cocksucking motherfucking duck each one a challenge each one addressed brilliantly by five of the best actors in this business here are the nominees for actor in a leading role and the Oscar goes to Zach Ward in Postal 
Feels good. Before the dude leaves, he is asked to sing the company fight song. It's not a flag, it's a company, high flying company, and it'll cheerfully work you to death. This was actually my number one most listened to song on my Spotify rap this year. The movie then cuts away to the denomination of organic mo monoth- mon To the denomination of organic monotheism. Or Doom for short. It's a cult that worships its leader, Uncle Dave, another character from Postal 2 who is actually the Postal Dude's uncle and is the leader of religious zealots in the town of Paradise. In the movie, he's seen as an icon that will lead the world into its final days. If you couldn't tell by the clever naming, this is a doomsday cult. Despite that, the cult does have one demon they still fear, the IRS. IRS. And after not paying for taxes for three years, they owe... 1.3 million dollars and 79 cents. Oh, fuck. One thing I do really want to give this movie props for is these weird miscellaneous shots that in any other movie would feel extremely out of place. But here they fit right at home, as what makes the Postal Games memorable are the extremely goofy NPCs that line the streets and buildings. And the movie adapts this pretty well. The There's a street hustler, you. crooked cops, and two horny old men. These characters actually make multiple appearances in the movies. Speaking of making multiple appearances, this is where we're first introduced to Faith, who is essentially the love interest for this movie. She's actually the worst part of the movie, as it feels like her whole character was shoehorned in to have a hot lady accompany the Postal Dude later on in this movie. But that's later. And we're talking about now. After this scene, the dude walks to Uncle Dave's cult compound, and this is another minor detail about this movie that I actually really like. In the Postal games, you mostly walk everywhere, with Postal 4 being the first game to really introduce the ability to drive. This minor detail makes the movie feel more at home with the games, and allows for the dude to get into more of those weird interactions with random people on the streets, just like the games. The dude does drive in this movie, however, but it's only really when the plot calls for it. Every other time, they call him the Wanderer, yeah, the Wanderer. He roams around, around, around. God, I'm fucking I'm gonna blow myself up with a fucking mini nuke. At Uncle Dave's compound, he tells the dude that he's got a plan to get him out of his IRS nightmare. You know, it's funny you showing up here like this. You know, because I find myself in a, in a financial situation. But the dude refuses, stating that he doesn't do that kind of work anymore, because last time he did, he was convicted for doing a little too much trolling, and couldn't get into a nice college or get a nice job anymore. And without a nice job, the dude relies on welfare, which is the next place in this journey, the welfare office. And hey look, it's the random street hustler, he's back! Since the United States has closed their borders, they're getting rid of the Statue of Liberty? I don't understand you! All that scrap copper is gonna be for sale. All waiting in line, this random guy goes a little... Postal... And shoots up the place. And what does our titular hero do in this incredibly dangerous event? He crawls around on the floor, stealing tickets from corpses in order to get a higher queue in the line. However, after looting all the bodies, the office closes because FUCK YOU! That's why. On his way home, he sees his trailer home shaking around and finds out that old Piggly Wiggly is fucking his wife. <laughs> <laughs> I hit old Piggly Wiggly. What was going through my mind when I wrote old Piggly Wiggly? <laughs> this is the moment that Walter White becomes Heisenberg. The dude runs to a phone booth to call Uncle Dave to tell him that he's finally been indoctrinated into the incel pipeline and now wants to take down the IRS to show dominance over society. However, this can't be done without one more random encounter NPC. And hey, it's our good friend the Hustler from earlier. See, in the last scene, the guy who shut up the welfare office didn't give him his pin back. So, he's been on a quest to find his pin, and all quest markers point to the dude. He runs up to him and politely asks him for info on his pin. However, this is the equivalent of a simple raider robbing you in Fallout, but you are currently equipped with an X-01 power armor and enough mini nukes to level Japan for a third time. Bin Lan shows up on TV and does Bin Lan things. I got nothing for this. I was born after 9-11, so all I know is TikTok trends, eat hot chip, and lie. Anyways, Bin Lan is speaking to Muhammad about how he loves him. America wants to protect it dearly. Get it? Get it? I lied. Anyways, again, Muhammad actually tells Bin Laden that he has a plan to take down the infidels, and that requires a shipment of crotchy dolls. I'm gonna go watch Oprah. But Muhammad isn't the only one who also wants to go after the crotchy dolls. Dave's plan in order to get out of the IRS's crosshairs is also to rob the shipment of crotchy dolls because apparently these things sell for an assload on eBay. 4,000 Four assloads to be specific. Dollars. Math then happens. In, in 2000, Times, times four thousand dollars is, uh, is eight. Uh, eight that's like no, it's eight hundred. No, eight, well, it's eight. You move. And then well, if it's if it's three zeros, and you move the decimal back. I don't think no. Well, wait. If you, it's a fucking lot of money. Oh, it's an ass load of money. Dude, the duo then plans out their GTA-styled heist, needing uh, multiple things in order to get the gold medal for the 100% completionist rank. Hey, look, J. Jonah Jameson again. He's telling the fine folks of Paradise that he's looking for a man running around in red and blue spandex, slinging white fluid everywhere. Muhammad takes this as a threat because in reality, he is Spider-Man. 
So he sends a dedicated Marvel fan to go deal with him. Oh yeah, the, the dude is also there buying lockpicks for later. The dude then goes on a Metal Gear Solid infiltration tactic in order to steal a, <gasps> a postal truck. Oh my God, it's it's the thing. It's it's a postal truck, like, like the game Postal. Holy fuck, it's the thing. I love it to the postal games where the post dude are delivering mail and said, I love being the postal dude. Sorry, uh, got, got a little carried away there. Anyways, the dude actually unable to lockpick the door because it's too high of a level uses a classic technique of using a disabled man in a scooter as a platform so he can crouch jump over the fence. Fucking speed run tactics right here. Submit this to G. DQ. Turns out this disabled man named Harry is actually a money glitch technique used by the crooked cop NPC from earlier. Yeah, that's all I can really say here. What great writing, Jamie. Cutting back to the dude and Dave, they're planning their GTA heist on Little Germany, and at the same time, the Taliban are also planning their heist on Little Germany as well. Both are going after the crotchy dolls being shipped there because that's the only place in the country that's going to have them after the freighter transporting them to the States crashed. This is fairly convenient to the plot. Why? Fuck you! During the Taliban's heist planning, Osama gets a Discord call from the one and only George W. Bush. Turns out he and Osama are great friends and love doing things together, like blow up towers to cause an international panic or blow up pipelines for insurance claims. You know, best friend things. God, I just love cutaway shots. We have another to a midget. This is actually a big international superstar that plays the crotchy character in the universe. And as part of the heist plans, the dude's team fucked with his transport, so now he's far from paradise. Honestly, that might be a good thing. Right. So, so the dude's team is dressed up as Hitler, and they're wearing Nazi armbands. Uh, for what reasons? It's funny. It's funny. Comedy funny. Little Germany's where the movie is at its climax, and we'll quickly see why. But first, we have to make our way past the Lederhosen booth and the concentration camp playground in order to get next to the stage to see the man himself. Uwe Boll. He's the owner of Little Germany, and as stated earlier, this is the only place in North America to have the crotchy dolls, because FUCK YOU! More NPC dialogue ensues, something about it's hitting a dog, dog, neck breaking, and putting sperm in bottles to feed children. They all got AIDS. Normal postal stuff. I honestly got nothing for this next scene, and it's probably honestly my favorite scene, just because of how fucking bizarre it is. I don't think I'll get shot by running with scissors for putting this in here, but who knows. I'll push my luck for the sake of this scene. To relay a tale only the heart can understand. That sounds amazing. What's it called? Punk. You know, there are all that rumors out that my movies are financed with Nazi gold. And what should I say? It's true. But somebody must do something with the money. Do you know that my father died in Auschwitz? My grandpa died also in Auschwitz. He fell from a watchtower. <laughs> Harald, okay, take her away. So. Something wrong, Bob? I get a little horny here on stage sometimes. If you see the crowd and all that children. Are you fucking kidding me? The dude then arrives at Little Germany and the heist begins. First dude and Dave must use a tactical distraction on the guards with his crew of God-loving women, luring them away to easily slip into the storage room with the crotchy dolls. Oh, also the international superstar shows up to Germany for the selling of the crotchy dolls. We'll worry about that later. Anyways, the tactical God-loving women return to the storeroom as well after incapacitating the guards. And sadly, one of them had a guard. Ooh, my mouth. The dude continues to smoke this literal roach of a blunt here, barely taking any puffs and letting the tactical god-loving women do the job of lifting the boxes for him. Because what else do you do with tactical god-loving women? Around this time, Osama and crew show up after getting lost earlier and crawl over the walls of Little Germany to infiltrate. And also around this time, the actual best scene in the entire movie happens. The crotchy mascot takes his hat off to reveal that he's actually. Paul, I'm Vince Sezzi. What the fuck you do to my game postal? I don't know what your fucking problem is. The movie is great. Vince Desi then pulls out a gun, attempting to shoot Uwe Boll, proclaiming it's FOR VIDEO GAMES, before ultimately dying. And also, this is where the dude is unmasked and shown to a crowd of people for the first time. A massive shootout then happens, where children get shot. Yeah, I, I can't show any of this on YouTube. If you want a visual representation of this, go, go install the killable children mod for Fallout 4 and you'll practically get the same effect. A lot of side characters get killed here, like Harry, the TV host guy, and <laughs> Uwe Boll. <laughs> Who's gonna make a load of the Dark Three now? Vern is then kidnapped in his own suitcase by Richie. Which, by the way, I just now realized I've not said who these characters are at all. They're kind of important main character, side character type guys. 
Vern is that international superstar I kept talking about earlier for the Crotchy Show. I just never mentioned him by name. And Richie's kind of like Dave's right hand man. Like I said, these characters are very important, yet when writing the review for this, I never saw them as important enough to write into the script until now. Anyways, yeah, Vern is then kidnapped in his own suitcase by Richie. This will all make sense later, just trust me. Also, the, the woman is back! Gee, I wonder if the movie is trying to set up a really shallow love interest, oh boy! The Great Pursuit then happens, where the dude is being chased by both the cops and the Taliban. This also happens. Oh, it's the Moo Cow from the Welfare Office. Sorry, we're closed. Bitch! This makes the police lose the dude. Cutting back to Little Germany again, generic newswoman number 428 lies on TV about how she cares about the dead kids? These kids are starting to smell. What? It was at this point in the script I started to get a little bit agitated that I felt like I had to write everything that was happening. I'm sure you can kind of tell. Uh, the dude and crew arrive back at the Doom compound, but oh no, the, the Taliban are already here. W what will the crew do now? The crew decides to go down into a secret underground fallout shelter that even Dave doesn't know about. And while doing it, the dude will ditch the truck full of crotchy dolls in a random place so the Taliban don't find them. He parks them right next to the welfare office because this movie had to make the most out of the street that they rented out. The scene has two classic postal references and gives the dude his name in film. Also known as Postal Dude. Postal Dude. Regardless of that, the cops are showing a group of people a picture of the dude, which seemed to be a direct reference to his appearance in Postal 1. Long hair, sweater, and all. Along with that, the dude says this. So if you see him, you ever just have one of those days? Mm, no. Hey, hey, the postal dude! The dude is then spotted being right here where the cops are, showing people his picture. And after running away and hiding in the lucky ganache, he sneaks out the back, gets caught by an officer, assaults said officer, and steals his uniform. Holy shit, it's just like the video game where you, where you do that, it's a gameplay mechanic, oh my god, it's so accurate! <coughs> God, that's hurting my voice. The dude comes back to the compound after losing the mob and proceeds to do some more Metal Gear stealth techniques to open the fallout shelter for everybody else. Sneaking inside, the dude takes a cat and puts it on his gun for it to be used as a silencer. If you are unaware, this is actually something you can do in the puzzle games and is one of the more popular gameplay mechanics. And Posal 3 won't ever shut the fuck up about this prop and its loading screens. Like seriously, there's like four different loading screens in Postal 4 and this is one of them always talking about how much the prop costs and only how it's shown on screen for two sec- Okay, I'm not here to talk about Postal 3. I'm here to talk about how the gang makes it inside the fallout shelter, which they all do successfully without any problems. Also, it's not a bomb shelter. It's a god, god shelter. shelter. Some stuff happens about the end of the world. Turns out Richie was evil the whole time or something. I don't even know, man. Fuck you! Upstairs, Muhammad tells the terrorists that the whole reason that they needed the crotchy dolls in the first place was so they could implant all of them with the avian bird flu to wipe out the U.S. entirely. Some plot convenience happens, Richie is a religious fanatic or some shit. Bro, I've lost the point with trying to explain what the hell is going on in this movie. Richie explains that they'll know the final days are coming because- On that day, a tiny entertainer will be raped by a thousand monkeys! Yeah, this is an actual scene that happens in this movie. God, I love this movie. Who amongst us? Amongst! Amongst! Like among us! Anyways, Muhammad appoints the retard as someone who sacrificed themselves for something. They, they never really say, but what they do say is that they don't know where Osama is. Does anybody know where the fuck he is? But we do because it's the next scene where Osama's in a seminar about learning how to better control your employees. Also, learned a fun fact about meth. Especially if you put crystal meth in the water. Now, some of you may be asking, isn't crystal meth illegal? Technically, yes, but the U.S. Air Force uses it to fuel their pilots when they're on night missions over Afghanistan. God, we're back here. Okay, so Dave turns on dude for his people. His people turn on Dave. Dave and Richie make out. Yes, it is very uncomfortable. Dave realizes he's gay. You know, good for him. I'm always happy to see people realize their true selves. Turns out Dave's true self also requires a bullet in his chest because Richie shoots Dave. Dave's then Dave then feels the touch of a woman's breast and realizes that he's bisexual. Good for him, you know, I'm always happy. Richie also realizes he can't kill the dude because he's the only one who knows where the truck is parked and it is very hard to find. And while distracting Richie by talking to him, he pickpockets some C4. Richie then puts the dude in a cell and using the C4, the dude commits what the voices in my head at 4chan keep telling me to do, make Realize homemade bombs. bombs. Which the dude does successfully. The dude's cool and awesome gearing up section happens and is now out for revenge on Richie. This is also the scene where the dude reveals his anarchist tattoo. This along with his p-shirt actually do a pretty good job of illustrating that the dude is a being of pure neutrality. 
neutrality as he is in the games. Like I said at the start of the video, overanalyzing this shit is kind of my whole shtick. Also, the tactical god-loving women join the dude on his quest to kill Richie and go upstairs at a cool, awesome terrorist killing scene. Also, two of the tactical god-loving women kill each other because they were faking being retarded or something. I I've lost whatever happened in like the last 20 minutes or so. Taking the Taliban's SUV, the dude drives back into town to kill Richie, but not before doing one more gearing up scene, and he finally gets the sunglasses. Now all he's missing is a trench coat and he'd be perfect. NPC interactions occur, women shows up, the dude is being chased down even though he is wielding a fully loaded machine gun, but you know, it happens. Backed into an alley, he takes off his sunglasses, damn, and unloads the machine gun into a crowd of NPCs. Woman shows up, they talk about something, team up, because yeah, I don't know anymore. Fuck you! The next scene happens. Looks Racism. Like your money's good. You're American, even though you're black. The next scene happens. A baby gets run over. The next scene happens. Hey, sex. Like I said, at this point, we're getting near the end of the movie, and I'm honestly running on fumes here. It's the final battle. The dude versus the entire town of Paradise, Terrace, and Richie. It's a blood-filled battle. Bullets are fired, and when all hope seemed lost, the dude tries to do something crazy. He Bitch. attempts to talk bomb to them. That can take out a whole city block, bomb. I got a Glock in my Rory. It's a heartfelt scene about how we as humans waste our lives battling our differences when all we need to do is come together and accept one another, even if we all don't see eye to eye, and also how we all hate Jews. We all hate Jews? Yeah, well, everybody knows that. Then. No, no, no. Shoot him. It doesn't work. The dude then tears down the entirety of the horde with his machine gun. During that, Osama runs away to make another call to George Bush to give him the fuck out of Paradise City, where the grass is green and the girls are pretty. Cutting back to the dude's fight with literally everyone, he nut blasts a man. That's about it. The next scene happens, the IRS shows up. The terrorists try to kill him, they forget the funny vest, and turns out the funny was in the car with Muhammad, and boom! That's that character done and dealt with. Speaking of characters done and dealt with... Okay, you're my publisher. You tell them that this is a prime example of why everybody should buy my book, How to Fire an Employee Without Making Him Go Postal, because I'm a fuck. The next scene happens, the dude kills Richie and spews the best one-liner of all time. Don't be a dick. No. Dick. Turns out Champ was in the back of the cop car, so no good boys die in the making of this movie. Turns out the US is getting nuked. Ah, well, it is what it is, really. We're still continue to make t-shirts for well under a dollar. Uh, anyways, what about the postal truck? I regret nothing. Yeah, he said the thing! Lard falls from the sky, the dude puts back on his sunglasses, and he and the women drive away into the sunset, with their futures unclear. The next scene happens, Osama and Bush are skipping through a field as the US gets nuked. And that's where the movie ends. What? So, yeah, that was the Postal movie. Like I said, I unironically, no joke, think this is the best game to film adaptation out there. And yes, I am very biased. The movie does so much right when it comes to the Postal franchise, featuring actual locations, characters, and gameplay mechanics that make this a great adaptation. And while watching the movie with some friends, my buddy Tyler mentioned something that was actually pretty cool. He mentioned how every single person in this film that's not a main character still look unique from one each other, and he said himself, kinda cool how they all got the extras to look just like NPCs. Which may have just been us overanalyzing the movie and not the true intentions, but hey, it's still cool detail nonetheless. But what about as a movie? Well, the movie suffers from a lot of things. The fact that this movie has a more dull color palette than Fallout New Vegas most of the time, the script is kinda eh, the jokes are kinda eh, useless characters that are there for no reason, some of which were just fully cut out of this review each time they showed up, and overall the story is just kinda plain bad. That's also the beauty of the whole thing, really. Postal is a game franchise known for not having the best writing or most well-received jokes. The franchise barely has a story, and the color palette of Postal 2 is also more drab than this movie, which is why this movie is a masterpiece that it is. It knew it wasn't going to be good at all, so embrace that. Hell, Uwe Boll himself said that this movie was made as a middle finger to Hollywood in general to get back at everyone who hated him and protested him in his movies. My source is that I made it the fuck up! Aside from all that, the only character I actually really want to talk about in this movie is the Postal Dude. Zack Ward does a great job portraying this character. Not only does he just kind of straight up look like him, but he also has some of those same mannerisms that the dude has within the franchise. My source is also on a side thing, you can actually play as Zack Ward in Postal nothing. 4, voice and everything. Except there, I don't think he fits as well because this face was made for one of the other three voice actors and not Scut Farkas. But I do like the movie-inspired outfit. That one is cool. 
Overall, I'm gonna give the puzzle movie a final and factual rating that hopefully won't cause Uwe Boll to email me demanding that I box him for saying this movie was bad. And that score is a FUCK YOU out of 10.